there's a lot of divisiveness when it comes to eating, deciding whether you want to eat animals or meat or what you eat on it, what, what, what you put on your plate, because um, it also represents what you pay for is like you're voting with your dollar, you know? And so I think that there are for sure, you know, ethical, moral, spiritual, environmental implications that are really important when considering what you eat as well. But I want to almost pin that for a little bit in the, in the, you know, duration of this conversation, because ultimately it's not compassionate if you want to eat one way, but it's not fully what your body needs. Mm. And so it should be all encompassing. What should be good for us should also be good for the planet. And so I want to objectively be able to delineate how a plant centric diet, um, is actually most beneficial for most people. And so I would love for you in your own words to articulate after looking at the variants in all, all these different studies, um, how do you explain um, what is going to be most beneficial for most people? Right. Yeah, and I'm glad that you raised that. And that's exactly how I wrote my book. I think, and I, I cop a bit of criticism potentially for that um, from, from the vegan community. Um, but my background and, and entire upbringing was around the objective nature of science. And, and I learned that from my dad, who's been a professor now in physiology for 35 plus years and has published, you know, hundreds and hundreds of papers in leading journals. So I think it's really important that we can have separate conversations here. Let's talk about the science. And then there's room for a broader conversation, um, you know, if, if someone wants to kind of go there. When I think about the food that we eat and how that, impacts our long-term health. So when I say long-term health, I really think about health span or longevity. Those two words almost uh, sort of speaking to the same thing, um, a little bit different to lifespan. Health span and longevity to me is about how, the number of years that you live in good health, right? The goal that I certainly have and a lot of the people that I communicate with is to compress the number of years where you're affected by chronic disease such that it's really affecting your quality of life. Mm. Yeah, it's not just to add, like I've heard you say years to your life, but life to your years. Yes, Love so, that. And, that, and I can't, I can't that, that cannot be attributed to me <laughs> because I'm sure I've heard that sure. from someone else. <laughs> but but, that's, great. Um, that's right. So we wanna add life to your years and when we really objectively look at the evidence, there's not an absolute answer here. <laughs> and that maybe is, will make some of the listeners a little bit uncomfortable. And I understand it. We want an absolute answer. You know, the, the, the very reason that when you walk into the bookshop, there's all of these contradictory books. <laughs> and you can tell they're contradictory just by reading the <laughs> title and maybe the subtitle is because we know to sell and market something, the absolute sells better than yeah. the more nuanced sort of answer. So bear with me if I sound a little bit nuanced, but you know, science is about reducing uncertainty. We go through the scientific method to reduce uncertainty so we get closer to a truth, but it's never absolute. But it allows us through that process to hopefully you know, navigate our lives better. And in this case, choose uh, our foods more wisely and have better health for longer. When you look at all of those different types of studies that I just, we went through before, rather than there being one single diet where I can sit here and say, Andre, eat exactly this. Right. <laughs> rather than that. Which there's no way you can honestly say that because like <laughs> there's just so much variety in what it means to be human and in our microbiomes yeah. and all of it, right? Yeah. And maybe at some point we can talk about genetics because yeah. I think, you know, a lot of what everyone is speaking about on podcasts and in books is the average. Right. Let's face it. When we look at these studies, what's what, what do we see with the outcomes? We see the average or typical. You're not average. I'm not average. The listeners aren't average. We all fall somewhere else on the, on the bell curve. Yeah. You might fall in the middle point, but it would, you know, it's not going to be everyone. So, what we see rather than a single diet being the one sort of prescription that we can give everyone is a theme. 
And that theme is a diet that's low in saturated fats. It's rich in unsaturated fats, particularly polyunsaturated fats, which I know is controversial online, but it's not controversial in the scientific literature. It's rich in fiber. It has a bias for plant protein, but it can contain animal protein, certainly. And it's low in ultra processed foods. That theme can be achieved a number of different ways. There are a lot of different variations of that theme, which I personally think is an amazing thing because it gives you choice, right? And people struggle with diets mostly from an adherence point of view. They're hard to follow. Right. So like if I'm going to give someone any sort of advice, it's to find that variation that you enjoy the most, leaves you feeling great and you can sustain because ultimately your health, your risk of getting metabolic conditions like type 2 diabetes or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, Alzheimer's dementia or cardiovascular diseases, having a heart attack or stroke is going to be affected by the way you eat over decades, <laughs> not over weeks. Yeah. Um, so that's the way that I think about um diet and, and sort of my thesis is more built around a broad theme and then educating people and showing them that you can actually, you know, uh, do that a number of different ways.